forward to this computer. Um, fantastic. Um, so I am very pleased um, to announce our last speaker of the term. Um, last and like a, certainly not 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 least, um, we have Guy Blanc, who is a um, who is a PhD student at um, Stanford in his like um, second year with a truly astounding number of papers. Has like a second year. PhD student, tell me your secret, please, because like, wow, I'm uh, very impressed. Um, and he's advised by like um, Lee Ington. And he will talk to us today about trees um, and the, and the, and, and the like a uh, computer science kind and not the uh, real life kind. Yeah, I'm, I'm sharing screen. And I will say for those in the audience, I encourage you to like, to, I encourage you to like um, have on your video if you're comfortable so our speaker can see some like human faces, um, which is always nice. And, and also feel free, feel free to like um, ask your questions during the uh, talk and just go ahead and kind of like unmute yourself um, and ask them. And they'll also have some time at the end for the kind of like longer, like a discussion style questions. Um, thank you, Guy. Take it away. Cool. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, well, here's a real life tree, but we'll be talking mostly about the computer science kind. Um, yeah, so I highly encourage questions. Um, I might not check chat, so just please feel free to start speaking. Also, if I'm looking down, it's because I'm looking at your faces on my screen below. And if I look up, I'm looking at my slides. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah, I'll tell you about uh, some joint work with some really great collaborators. Um, Jane, who's a PhD, PhD student at MIT, Mingda, PhD student at Stanford, and Leong, who's my advisor at Stanford. Um, and this work is properly learning decision trees in almost polynomial time. Okay, so let's dive in. So uh, the task we consider in this work is that of turning black boxes into decision trees. So we're gonna assume we have query access to some black box function we can ask for the value of f of x on any input x of our choice. Um, and throughout this talk, we'll consider all of our functions uh, having Boolean inputs and Boolean features and outputting a single bit. And given this query access, our goal is to output a decision tree that represents the function uh, that we have black box access to. Um, so first you might ask like, why is this an important question? Why do we want to create decision trees? So for one, decision trees are the canonical example uh, of an explainable model. So for example, given this tree on the left, suppose we have some input that reaches this leaf, and so it's classified as one. We might ask, OK, why did, this, did the decision tree uh, classify that as a positive example? And we can just like look at the path that example followed and say, oh, it's because the seventh feature was negative and the fourth feature was positive. Um, so they're very easy to explain. And there was actually lots of recent work at like say ICML and NeurIPS on building practical libraries uh, for creating decision trees efficiently and effectively. Um, a second reason is that decision trees are very fast to evaluate relative to the complexity. Um, and it's like hard to quantify complexity of different models. So just kind of like at a rough level, um, the time to evaluate a decision tree is proportional to its depth, but the number of parameters can be exponential in the depth. So you have a really nice trade-off between model complexity and speed to evaluate. Um, and lastly, decision trees allow us to compute f of x when we don't start by knowing all of uh, x, but we can pay either time or money to reveal features of x, to reveal individual coordinates. And decision trees are a natural representation that allow us to do that efficiently. Um, so what do we want in particular from our algorithm? Well, we're going to measure success in two ways. Naturally, we want a fast algorithm, and we're going to force our algorithm to actually write down the whole decision tree representation. Um, so, you know, it takes some time to do that. So our, our time will be at least the size of the tree we output. Um, and we want accuracy. Uh, you might ask, well, why not a perfect uh, function? But you can show that this problem or slight variance of it are MP hard um, if you require exact an exact tree. So we relax that slightly and allow um, for a little bit of error. Um, we're going to measure all our error over the uniform distribution. So the error, or I'll also say distance throughout this talk, is just the probability um, on a random input that the decision tree t differs from f. So we're going to want to be able to make this error arbitrarily small. 
Now, without any assumptions, uh, you can't hope to do that. If F is super complicated, there might not be any tree that gets good error or any small tree. And if you want to be fast, you can only output small trees. Uh, so it might be an impossible task. So to make this tractable, um, for now, we're going to assume that F can be represented by some small decision tree. Um, we don't know what it is, but our running time will be a function of the smallest tree for F. Um, and, and now for uh, our first main result. So given black box queries to a function F that has some size S decision tree, um, our algorithm will run in time poly and N, which is the number of features, um, and S to the log log S, which is kind of almost polynomial on that size. Um, and we'll output a tree that for any epsilon of our choice or constant epsilon for, for this runtime um, differs, uh, has only epsilon error. Um, I should say, uh, you'll see kind of the epsilon dependence in a late slide. I'm gonna hide it for most of this talk just for, for convenience and brevity, but it's a pretty reasonable epsilon dependence. Um, and I guess just to mention what I mean by size, it's the number of leaves, um, which is one off from the number of internal nodes. So it doesn't really matter uh, what definition of size we go with. Okay, um, and our result actually extends beyond that setting uh, to something called the agnostic setting. So we don't need to assume F is exactly a size S decision tree. Instead, we have some size S budget, let's say a size 100 tree. And we're gonna give you a tree that is almost as good as it can possibly be for that budget. So opt here represents the optimal possible error of that desired size. So if we have a budget of 100, and there is some tree that is 0.1 close to F of size 100, opt might be, or 0.9 close, opt might be uh, 0.9, and then we might uh, hope to get accuracy 0.89. Uh, so error, you know, 10% plus a little bit. So whatever the best possible error we can hope to achieve, we, we want that plus a little bit. Um, and this is sometimes called noise tolerant because you can imagine you start with some function that is actually a decision tree, and then you add in a little bit of adversarially chosen noise to turn it into something uh, that is not a decision tree. So yeah, any questions about the setup? Okay. Um, so uh, before we dive into kind of the structure of this talk, just a quick comparison with prior work. So you can think of S and N can have different quantitative relationships. But the most canonical setting is when we assume that the size of the tree is polynomial in n. This is, the, this is the largest size for which you can hope to have a poly n runtime because you have to spend at least s time outputting the tree. Um, and when we assume that our runtime is n to the log log n, which is where the almost polynomial of our title comes from. And in this setting, the previous fastest runtime um, was n to the log n. Uh, even in the realizable setting where we're assuming that that's the setting where we assume f is exactly a size s decision tree. And I'll refer to agnostic as the, the full generality where we only assume F is opt close. Um, so there are three different algorithms that, that achieve this n to the log n runtime. Um, and they, it, it's tight for all of them. So this was a little bit of a barrier of multiple different techniques running against this n to the log n. Um, there's a classic algorithm by Aaron Freudenhauser in 89, um, one by Meta and Raghavan in 2002, and then one by myself, Jane and Leung last year. Uh, so this is three of the authors on the current work I'm presenting. Um, and you'll, you'll see a lot more about these two algorithms because ours can really be seen as a mixture between MR and BLT. Um, and just one more thing to mention is if we change this choice of S, our algorithm still compares favorably to prior work. I'm just fixing kind of one setting of parameters to make everything easier in this talk. Okay, so um, now for the outline of, of the remainder of the talk, um, I'm gonna spend so a decent amount of time on MR and BLT, uh, because as I said, our algorithm really fits right in the middle. Um, and I, I think it's nice to kind of have the full context there. They're also really simple and elegant and I like them. Um, the second uh, is that in order to analyze our algorithm, we're going to need a new decision tree pruning lemma. Um, and this will make more sense when I get there, but just as like a, a one sentence summary, we show that we can prune a tree, so kind of remove paths of it, such that every node has a desirable property. That property would be very important for algorithm without changing the, the tree too much. Um, and well, that'll make more sense uh, when, we, when we get there. Um, and this pruning lemma uh, drinks in the theorem of O'Donnell, Sachs, Schramm, and Servideo, which was a key ingredient in BLT. 
Um, so it's not surprising that by uh, strengthening a key ingredient of a previous algorithm, we're able to generate an algorithm uh, that has a faster runtime. Um, and for most of this talk, I'm going to focus on the realizable setting. That's when f is exactly a size s decision tree. Um, but at the end, I'll talk about what little part breaks when we move to agnostic and then how we can fix that. Cool. OK. So first, diving into MR, BLT, and then where our algorithm sits. So we're going to think of a spectrum here from brute force to UD algorithms. Uh, and first, I'm going to describe to you MR's algorithm. Um, and you'll see that it, it kind of does brute force. It really does like a lot of work at each step, trying all possible all possibilities. And then BLT, um, which you'll see really like has a completely opposite idea. It's going to greedily pick something that's decent, uh, and then you know it might take more steps, but each step will be faster. And both ends will require n to the log n time. And then you'll see this work where uh, it's like half greedy, half brute force. Uh, that'll be more clear later, but it really smash them together and you get our algorithm, okay? So uh, first we'll dive into MR. Um, so the high level idea of MR is to create a subroutine um, with like really a, a strong guarantee. So uh, the subroutine will take as input a function F, uh, query access to it, and some depth budget D um, of how large of a tree or how deep of a tree do we wanna build. And it's gonna output the best possible depth D decision tree for this function. So one with minimal error amongst all depth D decision trees. Um, and this is really strong. Um, and indeed, it does take a decent amount of time to do this. But uh, we'll see on the next slide that recursively, it's, it's really easy to write pseudocode uh, that has this input output guarantee. And you just you kind of get like a, an inductive proof that writes itself um, that this will be satisfied. But remember, our goal is to, to build a decision tree assuming F has a size S decision tree, not depth D. So in order to use this subroutine, uh, we're going to, to use one fact, which is not too hard to show, um, that if uh, T is a size S decision tree, you can cut it off at depth D equal a tiny bit more than log S. Uh, and you're going to get a tree uh, that is very close to T. So if f is equal to a size s decision tree, it has some depth, roughly log s tree that is close to it. And if we have the subroutine, uh, we can then call it with depth log s, and we're going to find one at least as good as the one we guaranteed. Yeah, any questions about uh, the, the high level idea behind MR? OK, great. OK, so writing the pseudocode, um, if the depth budget is 0, well, there are only two depth zero trees, either the constant zero tree or the constant one tree. We're just going to try both and return the one with minimal error. Um, just I'm ignoring approximation uh, estimates or estimation errors and how you compute the error. Um, you can track all of those and it doesn't change anything materially. For the purpose of this talk, I'm going to allow us to estimate many things to perfect accuracy. So let's just say we can actually figure out whether the constant zero or constant one function is best. So at d equals zero, not much to do. Try both possibilities see which is best. The more interesting case is when uh, we have some depth. So you know we have to build some nodes in this tree uh, and decide what to put there. And the key insight with MR is that as long as we can pick a good route, we're essentially done. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick, we're going to set TI to be the tree with minimal error amongst all those with XI at the root. And we're going to do that using our inductive hypothesis hypothesis in uh, recursively. So if we are forced to put xi at the root, then we want to minimize error on the two subtrees uh, to minimize the overall error of the tree we return. And we do that by just recursing, right? We can use the function search, which has this really strong guarantee to have minimal error on the left subtree and similarly on the right subtree. And just this little bit of notation here, um, this is the restriction of f um, where we force xi to be, uh, to be zero. Uh, which just means just look at just those inputs in which xi equals zero and consider that new function. Um, and we do this because that course, like when we measure the error of this subtree, we're only measuring it on inputs with xi equals zero because those are the only inputs that reach that tree. So inductively, uh, this will be the tree with minimal error amongst those with xi at the root. And then we just try all n possible roots and we return the tree with minimal error. And you know, by our inductive hypothesis, one of those has to have minimal error. So this is a, 
by brute force, I mean kind of we're trying all n groups. And I, I claim that this procedure uh, has the input output guarantees on the previous slide. Now you might wonder how much time this takes. Um, essentially, we just need to count the number of recursive calls. Um, other overhead is, is quite small. Um, and at every kind of layer of depth, we have n possible roots, each of which makes two recursive calls. So kind of unfolding all of that, we get to two n power d recursive calls, um, which for our choice of d will be n to the log s, ignoring you know, a minor epsilon factor. Um, and that's how long this takes. So, so we have kind of one part of this diagram completed. Um, and I'm writing this n to the log n, because remember, we're, we're considering the s equal poly n regime. Um, and I have a tagline here. Um, and you know. Maybe this seems obvious, but it's, it's, I think, really the key insight of MR, which is that among all n possible variables, there is a perfect choice for the root, uh, where perfect here means if I put it down, I can then achieve minimal error. And really, MR is going to spend all its time trying to find this best root. And that will be in pretty sharp contrast to BLT, um, which will have the tagline that the most influential variable is a good root. And I'm going to define influential for you in a moment, um, but it kind of takes the opposite end of I'm going to quickly find you know, a decent enough root, and then I'm going to run with it. OK, so now diving into BLT, um, I'm going to refer to influence as a splitting criterion. This is just some terminology that's uh, used in many practical uh, algorithms. And uh, this BLT work was actually motivated by understanding many of those. Um, but I'm not going to spend too much time on that. So you'll, you'll see exactly what the pseudocode is on the next slide. Um, but just influence will be very important. Um, so the influence of a variable i on a function f um, is this quantity, which is the probability over a random input that if we flip the i bit, we also flip the value of the function. So equivalently, you can imagine fixing the other n minus 1 coordinates other than i um, randomly, and then asking what is the probability that I need to still know this i bit in order to know the function's value. Um, and this is a very common notion um, in TCS uh, analysis of Boolean functions, like social choice theory. Uh, it's, it's appeared in, uh, in many different areas. Um, and just um, relating this algorithm to practical ones, practical ones uh, work very similarly to what you'll see on the next slide. Um, they don't use influence as their splitting criteria, uh, but they use often use things that are like quite close. Um, and we have a more detailed discussion um, in the BLT work from last year. Okay. So how is the greedy algorithm going to work? It's still going to take in a function in a depth budget. Um, and you know, when the depth is 0, there's still not very much to do. Um, we're just returning the constant 0 or one function of minimal error. Um, but in the, in the case when d is not 0, now, now we do something a little different. Um, we're going to use queries to f to identify the variable with at least approximately the largest influence on f. And then we're going to return the tree. We're not going to try anything. Just immediately place that variable at the root and then recurse down uh, greedily down the two subtrees until we run out of depth. And then we, we giggle it to this step. And um, the advantage of this greedy algorithm is you're spending less time at each step, right? You make two recursive calls rather than 2n of MR. And so our runtime, you know, ignoring the slight overhead of each call, um, is just 2 power d which is better than what MR has. So, so far, it looks like we're in better shape. But the downside is we're not picking as good of a route. So it's not obvious that this procedure will terminate or that we can run this to some small depth and still achieve high error because we're not necessarily picking the perfect route, just one that, that seems like it should be good. Uh, and indeed, BLT are able to show, or I guess in prior work, we are able to show um, that running this to depth roughly log s squared um, is sufficient to get high accuracy, uh, any high accuracy of your choice. And you know, putting this into the runtime on the previous slide, we get s to the log s runtime. So uh, this procedure does work reasonably well. Um, and they show that uh, this, this analysis can't be tightened. Um, there is a function that is a size of decision tree, such that even to achieve 51% accuracy, you do have to go up to depth log s squared. OK. So now just we have these two taglines, right? We have, uh, if we look at question, all n variables. Yes, go ahead. So you had a lower bound on the previous slide. 
Yeah. So yeah. do you mean the sizes decision tree constructed using this specific method? Not any decision tree, right? I mean, there is a function that is originally a size s decision tree, um, yeah. such that if you use this method to construct it, you're going to have to build a size s to the log s tree. Oh, okay, yeah, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a lower bound against this one algorithm. Yeah, great question. Yes, and, and please do interrupt me like that for, for everyone. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, okay, so where were we? So um, we have one end of the spectrum, you know, among all n variables. If we look at all of them, we can pick a perfect root. And we have BLT, which says, ah, just take the most influential, you know, it's, it's somewhat good. So like, if you look at this, there's kind of an obvious thing to try, and, and indeed that's what we do try, um, which is look at some small set of the most influential variables and, and just try those. Um, and you know, it, it's not clear that this will work, um, but that's what we're gonna show. We're gonna show among the polylog s most influential, which is quite a small set, um, there is a really great group. Um, and when I say great, you'll see it's, it's really essentially perfect. Um, it's basically as good as MRs, um, but, uh, kind of all of that formality uh, and what we mean by that will, will be clear later. Okay, so we finish most of the discussion of MR and BLT. There'll be kind of one more slide comparing the three algorithms later. Um, but for now, we're, we're mostly moving into our algorithm, um, which will end up being a generalization of both MR and BLT. Okay, so our pseudocode um, has the same two parameters as before, a function F, a depth budget D, but now we have an additional parameter k, which you can think of as a, a greediness parameter. Um, and you know, in, in a few clicks, it'll be very clear what it does. So you know, once again, the first line, just do the only thing you can, return the best constant zero or constant one function if your depth is zero or depth budget. Otherwise, um, for each of the k most influential variables of f, try all of them. And then when you put them at the root, recurse down with you know, the restriction, one less step in the same greediness parameter. Um, and then return the tree with minimal error with respect to F. So um, just to, to make this pseudocode, to match this up with previous algorithms, if K equals one, you're only trying the most influential variable. And so you recover BLT, right? I mean, we say return the tree with minimal error, but there's only one choice. So you're just returning the tree with the most influential variable at the root. If K equals N, then you're trying all possible roots. Um, you're doing that at every layer of recursion and you're returning the one with minimal error. And that is exactly what MR does. But for K somewhere in the middle, this is a new algorithm. Um, and and that's, that's what our algorithm will do. So yeah, any questions about the pseudocode? Okay, great. Um, and once again, you know, the, the runtime analysis is pretty easy, ignoring like slight overheads of computing the influences and et cetera. Um, it's just 2K recursive calls uh, for a level, the levels, so you get 2K power D. Okay, um, so, so how good this, can this be? Well, we can think of it as first we fix our greediness parameter K, and then once we fix K, we're forced to go to a certain depth to achieve high accuracy. Um, we're gonna go as deep as we need in order to have good accuracy. And you know, first, MR showed that if we make the greediness parameter n, it's sufficient to go to depth log s. I mean, you know, you do 2n power log s and, and you get this n to the log s runtime for MR. And BLT showed that if we make this greediness parameter of one, um, it's sufficient to go to depth log s squared, um, which once again, gets a similar runtime in this case, s to the log s. But what we're gonna show is that if you make this greediness parameter poly log s, just a little bit more than BLTs, you can actually go just as deep as MR, just to log S, um, and you're still going to achieve high accuracy. And I haven't proven to you that like this dot is good enough for high accuracy, but that's where it's going to go later uh, once, once we prove it. Um, and just for our runtime, it's going to be poly log S power log S. Um, and if you simplify this, it's log S power log S simplifies to S to the log log S, um, which is what we get. Okay. So how do we go about proving that this dot is sufficient that we can just go to this step given that greediness parameter? Okay, so this procedure uh, finds f comma d comma k, it has the search space of trees and it's gonna give us the best tree in that search space. So 
if you recall for MR, um, this is when K equals M, um, that search space is all depth D trees. And we argued that MR gives you the best tree of depth D. Now, find uh, with you know, a smaller gradient parameter isn't searching over all of those, but it's searching over a, a pretty substantial subset. The, in order to be in this search space, and well, this is an if and only if, you are in this search space, if for any path in the tree, the variable queried at that path is one of the k most influential variables um, of that corresponding subfunction. So if your tree has depth d and at every location it queries one of the k most influential variables, I claim it's in the search space of find, and find is going to give us the best possible tree in that search space. So once we accept that, uh, what we want to prove is this. We want to say if f is up close to any size s decision tree, not necessarily one in the search space, there is a tree in the search space that is opt plus epsilon close to it. So there is a slightly worse tree in the search space uh, having these properties uh, for f. Now I should say, as stated, this theorem actually is, is slightly false. Um, it's only true when opt equals zero. We're going to correct it in the case when opt is not equal to zero. Um, but for simplicity now, assume opt equals zero, this hope for theorem will be true. Um, and yeah, so we're assuming F is exactly equal to a size S decision tree. Okay. So how are we gonna do this? We're gonna tell you how to look at your tree and prune it to fall in the search space. Now, just, um, just to kind of back up a little bit, F, we're assuming F is equal to a size S decision tree, but we don't know it. So like this pruning procedure is not something our algorithm is actually doing. But it's just sufficient to argue that you know, there is a way to find a prune tree T prime in our search space, because then our, our algorithm is going to give you the best tree in the search space, which will be at least as good as T prime. OK, so, so what do we want of our pruning procedure? Um, well, one, we want it to, to only have a little bit of error, so that way we're happy with T prime. Two, we want it to lead to a depth of roughly log s. And three, um, we're going to guarantee that for every internal node in the tree, um, the variable queried has high influence. Now, this is actually not what I had on the previous slide. On the previous slide, I said every internal node is one of the k most influential, um, which is not necessarily equivalent to it having high influence, though they seem very related. Um, and indeed, we're going to use this fact um, that uh, since f was exactly a size of decision tree, all of its restrictions are exactly size of decision trees. And you can show uh, with not too much work that there aren't many variables of high influence. So it will be sufficient to show that every variable has high influence, because if it does, it's one of only a few highly influential variables and therefore one of the K most influential variables. So uh, then hope for theorem in the case where opt equals zero um, will be proven because uh, T prime is accurate for T. So we're happy if we find it and it has small depth and uh, each variable queried is one of the k most influential. So any questions about what we're going for here? Yeah, I have a question. So maybe I missed this. Great. So what do you mean the t prime is an accurate tree for t? Yeah, we mean that um, over a random input, the probability that t prime and t uh, give a different classification is at most epsilon. OK. Yeah, good question. Thanks. Yeah, really, want, really we want accuracy for f. Um, because you know we ultimately measure with respect to f, but for now we're assuming that f is equal to this tree t. So uh, for now we'll just talk about uh, error to t. Okay, great. Okay, so um, one of these is actually easy to achieve. Um, the the small depth we actually use this in MR. Um, take any size of decision tree, cut it off at depth roughly log s. Now it's depth uh, roughly log s, and you have an incredibly much error. So uh, I'm not going to go over that. Uh, that that is a, a pretty standard fact. Um, but I'm going to spend more time on this uh, on achieving high uh, influence at each node and proving that that doesn't lead to much error, which is our pruning lemma. Okay. So well, okay. So remember, our goal is to change the tree T into a tree T prime such that every node in it has influence at least tau, um, some threshold. Um, so now I'm going to tell you our pruning procedure, which remember we're not calling, but we're just using the fact that it exists. 
Um, so we're gonna, it's gonna be a, a recursive procedure that will kind of do what it needs to do. It's gonna go through the tree and make sure things have high influence. So starting at the root, we ask, okay, does this node have high influence? If it does, we're happy. Um, we can keep the node um, and we're gonna move down the tree uh, recursively called pruning uh, on the two subtrees with the two subfunctions. And that's gonna take care of everything beneath us. The more interesting case is when um, the root does not have high enough influence. We cannot keep it because it does not meet our criteria. So we're gonna get rid of it. And once we get rid of it, well, we can't keep both subtrees because we've, we've lost the stitching that connects them. So we can only keep one of them. And we're just gonna like try both, keep whichever is better. So you can imagine pruning this tree, pruning this tree, see which has less error on F and keep it. Um, so our pruning procedure is like kind of doing what it needs to do. Um, and you know, it's gonna go through the tree and every time it, it gets this thing, it's gonna cut off uh, some part of the tree, recurse, keep recursing down um, until the entire tree uh, satisfies this, uh, every node has high influence. And what I need to prove to you is that, you know, every time we call this, we're only incurring a little bit of error and we can add that error up over all times we perform a pruning and say that not much error uh, has been incurred. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so you discard after recursively pruning or before? Um, you can actually do it either way, but for now think of the case where you try pruning both things and then you look at which has less error and then you discard one. Okay. Yeah, um, I think that would be efficient, but it doesn't actually matter for our purposes. Does it matter um, which one you choose? I mean, I'm assuming if the influence is smaller than both of them are basically invariant to flip an XI. So does it matter uh, which one you choose? So um, you, choosing randomly, I think would be sufficient, uh, but I think we want to avoid the case where one happens to be really good for F and one not. Um, it might end up being okay within a factor of two, uh, but for now we will assume but that we picked the better. How can that be? Because if one is really good and one is really bad and they're really far from each other, right? So yes, so we're uh -huh. just gonna, um, it, yeah. I think it's, it's equivalent up to a factor of two. Um, uh -huh because one might be like exactly equal to the function and one must be all the way off. But you're exactly getting the intuition right, which is when the influence is small, these two trees are, are close to one another. And we're gonna use that to say that we haven't incurred much error. But yes, I think up to a factor of two, it's okay. The one concern I have is that the factor of two kind of uh, multiplies as you go. I think it probably won't, um, but I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, but the depth is small, so it's probably be okay. Yeah, well, we don't want to incur two power D error, but may, I'm not sure if that's what happens or not. All right, thanks. Yeah, good question. And yeah, that's exactly the intuition. When the influence is small, um, we're not going to incur much error. So we're only cutting off things when, when we can. Okay, um, so this is, this is our pruning lemma. So choose any function F, any decision tree T. Um, no, we're not assuming F and T are the same even though that's when we're instantiating this, um, or at least that's when we're instantiating this for now. Um, it ends up being important to imagine F and T are different. Even if you want to instantiate it when they're the same, as you, as you call this inductively, you're gonna have cases when they're not equal. Um, so separating into two functions ends up being really important. Um, this is also true of uh, all the proofs of OSSS I know, and, and this kind of builds off those proofs. Um, so that's like one key like, thing you have to wrap your head around. You have to separate them in order to do induction. Okay, that was an aside. What do we prove? We prove uh, any function f, any tree t, after pruning the tree t so that every node has influence at least tau with respect to f, the distance from that tree to f is only at most d times tau more than the distance you started with. So just some intuition, when tau is zero, we prune nothing. So, you know, you haven't incurred any error. Um, when tau is very large, we're pruning more, so we're incurring uh, more error, and the amount of error uh, we incur will just scale multiplicatively with d. I okay. have a question. Would yeah. it make sense to try and sort of, you know, start with tau, maybe very small, but so slightly try to increase it as you go down the tree because you go into like, the lower depth trees? That's a good question. Um, I think in the inductive proof, it's really like you actually end up paying basically one tau, like tau per depth you use it at. Like I imagine if you had a different tau for each depth, you would just pay the sum of the taus. 
Um, I, I don't think you actually end up getting savings like that, but I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, I think I think this would generalize to like if you have a different tile for every depth, just sum them up. So it might be it might be the case that it's somehow better to have different tiles, um, but um, not 100% sure. Cool, good question. Thanks. Um, okay. So we're gonna uh, prove this by induction on D. Um, there's a base case. The base case when D equals zero um, is just, this is zero and you don't do any pruning. So um, this all holds with equality. Um, in the inductive case, there are two steps, uh, or two cases. Um, the one where you prune and the one where you don't. The one where you don't prune um, is a less interesting case. Uh, and it looks very similar to this case, except you do less things. So I'm gonna focus on the harder case. Um, which is when the root has small influence. And so we have to prune. Okay, so inductively gonna prove that this holds in this case, assuming it holds at depth D minus one. Okay, and this will be the most technical uh, slide of the talk. Um, there'll, be, there'll be a block of equations. I'll explain each one. Uh, hopefully uh, it's all clear, um, but if not, it, it won't, the rest of the talk won't rely on it too much. Okay, so, um, we want to prove this distance upper bounded by uh, you know, distance of the F and T uh, plus this D times tau term. The first thing we're going to do is um, remember we picked the better subtree here. So here B is a random variable, um, zero or one with probability 50% uh, each. Um, and you know this TB is uh, each of the two subtrees. Um, so we start with saying the minimum of two numbers less than or equal to their average. So we're just going to consider the average error on these two. Um, then we're going to imply our inductive hypothesis. So the subtrees are each step d minus one. So this is a valid step. Um, and you know because they're depth d minus one, the extra error incurred is now d minus one times tau. And uh, we're now comparing distance between f um, and tb expectation over the two subtrees. Okay. And now we're going to do kind of the step that maybe uh, is least obvious at first, but in hindsight makes things a lot better, um, which is triangle inequality. So we're going to expand this distance into two distances. First is the distance between f and the restriction of f um, to xi equals b. So kind of the subfunction corresponding to, to that half of execution. And then, you know, by the other half of triangle inequality, so the same subfunction and tb. And, and we're dropping this down, uh, that this stayed the same. Um, and the reason we're doing this is because each of these two quantities um, is easier to analyze. Okay, um, and well, what do they end up being? Well, the first one is, okay, this is asking these two functions. The first one is just F. The second one is F where you force XI to be B. So it's like saying, okay, fix all the coordinates but I and then force the last one to be either one or zero. What is the probability those two functions differ? That is just the influence. The second one um, ends up being the distance between F and T because this distance is defined as, okay, pick a random input. What is the probability F and T differ? Well, that's the average of the probability they differ when XI equals zero and the probability they differ when XI equals one, um, which is exactly what this is doing in the B equals zero and B equals one case. So that drops down to distance. And well, we just get the D minus one times tau dropping down. And now we're basically done. Um, now this influence, uh, we, we assumed it was less than tau in order to do any pruning. So that adds in here. Um, we get a d times tau and we drop this down. And that is what we wanted to prove. Okay, any questions about this pruning proof? So, so the tau that you choose is essentially something like one over b for that to be useful. Yeah. Yeah, we're gonna choose. Uh, we're gonna choose like epsilon over d, exactly. Yeah, and then since the total influence is about d, so you have like these code options. Exactly, and d squared uh, will be log s. Yeah. Yeah. Now I have a question. If you assume to begin with, you're close to depth d instead of size s. Does it make anything easier? Um, I think there will be like some log one over epsilon in our final runtime that uh, you get rid of, um, but not substantially because you can cut off to depth. Uh, D like equals log S over epsilon um, right at the beginning. Okay. Yeah. And actually um, this lemma holds with the log S here instead of D. I'm just putting D for simplicity. Um, but yeah, there, there's a slightly stronger statement than this. Mm 
Okay, great questions. And yes, please keep asking. Okay, so, so where are we? So we start with the assumption that there is some size S tree T for F. We can cut off all the deep uh, nodes, we get plus epsilon error. And then we can run our pruning lemma, um, which incurs an additional epsilon error to ensure that every uh, node has high influence. This final tree falls into the search space of find f comma d comma k, where we're choosing k to be roughly log s squared, um, and we're choosing d to be roughly log s. Uh, and therefore, this find procedure will either find it or a better tree in time, uh, the overhead in each step is poly n. So poly n times do 2k uh, power d, which ends up being poly n times s to the log log s. So that completes the proof in the realizable setting. Okay. So yeah, that, that's uh, kind of the, what is the main portion of the talk. Now I'm gonna spend a little bit of time comparing our pruning lemma to OSSS. Um, and then not everything I said, there's one thing that doesn't go through in the agnostic setting, um, but I'll talk about how we get around that. Can I ask a question? Yes. Before you compare to OSSS? Yeah. Do you think your algorithm of subvariant could, it could work if you replace decision trees with decision lists? Decision tree with decision list. Um, decision list, is it uh, kind of one-sided? Like you either exit or you keep going down, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I haven't thought about it much. One thing I'm concerned about is that our algorithm is efficient with respect to size of the tree. Uh, oh, maybe that. So decision list, kind of only the depth matters, right? So our runtime is roughly d power d, um, which in terms of size is efficient. In terms of decision lists, I'm not sure that's as satisfying. In particular, I'm guessing for decision lists, you often want distributions where you like have a high probability of getting deep, in which case, um, like if D is larger, it doesn't look so good. Um, but I'm not. I haven't thought about it enough. So I think I think the most influential at the root algorithm would work for decision lists, if I understand the the question. So you do not. Have, yeah. Sort of. I think no. this like previous work that shows this. Like if you your target is a decision list. Just keep plunking down the most influential variable, and you'll learn the target in in you know in in perfect time. Uh, yeah. Or here you mean decision lists, where each node contains an arbitrary conjunction? Yeah. I uh, mean, yeah. yeah. Even I a conjunction, see, you, you, you either you either output the value or you keep going down the list. I see. So it's like a k decision list where each. Yeah. Yes. I, yes. And yes. I take back my statement. My statement was, thanks Rocco. My statement was for just regular decision lists where you branch on a single variable. Oh, no, so, I meant a conjunction, yeah. Yeah. Are these decision lists, um, are you measuring size as the decision tree expansion or is like and compressed into a, a smaller size? So, I mean, you have two parameters usually when you have the, the size of the conjunction, which is like the width, and then you have like how many terms you have, which is like the depth. But you can actually, like similar here, you can just sort of, replace one with some log of the other so that you know, approximate things you know, properly. Yeah, yeah, it, it might work. I'm not sure about the parameters though. Um, oh yeah, that's an interesting question. Interesting question. One can ask about just decision trees where the internal nodes are also conjunctions, right? So mm -hmm. that's a further generalization of Shah's question. Yeah, and it might be possible to do yeah. something with the pruning lemma um, to, to get better parameters by like actually knowing this rather than kind of doing something black box, but I haven't thought about it. Okay, yeah, uh, thank you. Um, okay, comparing to OSSS, um, our, our proof is motivated by one of the proofs for OSSS. Um, this one is uh, the influence lower bound to the query elimination. Um, so it's, it's motivated by it. Uh, it's not surprising that it implies OSSS, but I'm gonna just give you kind of the one line proof um, that it implies OSSS, or at least the version of OSSS um, that is important for BLT, that, that is important for the other decision tree learning algorithm. Okay. So what does OSSS says, say? It says every size S decision tree is either epsilon close to constant or there is a variable of influence at least epsilon over log S. So basically every decision tree that is somewhat balanced has a highly influential variable. Um, and well, it has a very apt uh, title 
every decision tree has an influential variable. And one line proof um, from pruning. So if T has no influential variables, right, our pruning lemma guarantees that every variable place will have high influence. There's no options. Um, so our pruning lemma prunes everything away. And then it returns a constant function. But we argued that it doesn't incur much error. Um, and you can see that parameters exactly work out. So that way, the resulting uh, tree is a constant that's epsilon close to t, which is exactly what this form of OSSS proves. Cool. OK. Um, and now on to the agnostic setting. So um, up till now, we've been assuming that f is exactly a size s decision tree. Um, starting now onwards, we're going to assume that f is up close to a size s decision tree. Um, most things go through. Actually, all of this goes through. If f is up close to some size s decision tree, we can still show via pruning that f is up plus epsilon close um, to a tree in which every node has high influence and you know the depth isn't too large. But is it uh, influence with respect to f or with respect to t? To, uh... Uh, with respect to f, because you don't know t. So um, when you're running your algorithm, you're measuring all your influences with respect to f. Okay. Yeah, it would be it would be a lot easier if it was respect to t. Um, but yeah, we don't know what t is in the case when f is only opt close to t. Um, okay. Yeah. So. Okay. So pruning still goes through. We can guarantee every node has high influence, but. If you recall, this wasn't sufficient. We wanted to guarantee that each node queried one of the k most influential variables. In the realizable setting, we use the fact that, you know, if we assume that f is a size of decision tree, f pi also is, and there aren't many variables of high influence. It turns out this is false if f is merely close to a size of decision tree. It's actually like very false. You can, you can like randomly change a decision tree just a little bit and not, not even adversarially. And with this random change, make all the uh, variables have high influence. So you would need to check everything. Um, so it kind of fails in all of the worst possible ways. Um, so you know we would have to run find with k equals n, we recover MR, um, we don't get any speed up. OK, so how are we going to fix this? The solution is to consider a function that's kind of like f, but is much smoother. Um, and smooth here, like intuitively means not a lot of influence. Um, the reason that random function made many highly influential variables is because it's very jagged. Um, and we want to smooth it out into something similar to f, but without a lot of influence. Um, so we define the delta smooth version of f. Um, and this is a common definition. Um, we're just using it for our purposes. So we define it like this. f sub delta of x is, uh, is this expectation, where in order to sample y, we start with x. For each coordinate with probability delta, we randomly flip it. And we take the expectation of f of y over all of these points, which you should think of as like somewhat close to x. We're kind of taking a random ball around the input, or like a ball around the input, and looking at the expectation um, of f around that in that ball. Um, just some intuition here. If delta equals 0, nothing ever gets flipped. Um, so this expectation is just equal to f of x. And so f delta equals f. If delta equals one half, that's kind of like the maximum amount of, of delta we'll consider. Um, regardless of what x you start at, y will always be uniformly chosen, right? With probability 50%, we're still flipping every coordinate, um, in which case uh, you end up with a constant function everywhere. That's like super smooth, but you've lost essentially all information about f. And for delta somewhere in the middle, you've done a little bit of smoothing, uh, but you still retain some information about f. Um, so, why is this useful? Um, well, uh, it's a pretty standard fact using uh, the Fourier analysis of Boolean functions that f delta only has a few variables of high influence. Um, this is actually true purely as a function of delta independent of what f you started with. So we, it doesn't matter kind of what function, how, how nasty and random it is, we smooth it. There aren't too many highly influential variables. OK, um, so now how are we going to use this? We start with our decision tree or our function f, up close to some size s decision tree. We're going to imagine pruning with respect to f delta. 
Once we do this, we guarantee every node has high influence with respect to F delta or its corresponding subfunctions. And then we're gonna use the fact that now there aren't too many variables of high influence. The number of variables with influence more than tau is at most, at most one over delta tau squared. Um, so we can run our procedure with respect to F delta. So as we go, we're pretending we want to learn F delta. Uh, whenever find asks for a query, behind the scenes, we figure out what F delta should be and we give that to find. Uh, but we run the exact same procedure otherwise on this function F delta. Um, it, it, we, we show that it finds a tree just like this. Um, it's not obvious that that gives you a one times opt plus epsilon close tree for F, um, but indeed with a little bit of work, we can show that's the case that if you run this fine procedure on F delta, um, you get this op plus epsilon, which is exactly what we wanted to show. But I, I have a question about that. Yeah. So if you choose delta to be much less than one of a, the depths of the tree, then, the, then this doesn't affect the decision tree type probability. So if you have a tree that's very close to F and also a bit noisy in it out, should not make a difference. Yes, um, but that, that it, we actually use that fact, but we're not noising up T, we're noising up F. So if F is only opt close to a decision tree and you add a little bit of noise, the best bound we can have is that it's now too opt um, close to the noisy version of F. Think, think of F as- But, like but, I, mean, but I mean, the, the distance of F delta from T is the same as the distance of F from T delta. Yes, exactly. I mean, you're, you're seeing the proof now. Uh, that, that's what we're using. All right. All right. Yeah. yeah, there's like a bunch of like, uh, I, I like to call it the diagonal uh, equality, or self adjoinness of noise. But yes, I have a diagram that's like an overflow slide of how we use this. Um, but yeah, that's exactly what we do. Cool. Um, yeah, any other questions about this? Okay, great. So I think time looks great here. So uh, just some very minimal future directions, um, some things to explore in the last few minutes. Um, so one, just to recap our main result, um, given queries to a function that is opt close to some size S decision tree, our algorithm runs in time um, N squared times roughly S of the log log S. Here is our epsilon dependence in its full glory um, and outputs a size S decision tree um, that is essentially as good as you can hope for, um, for this function F within epsilon close. Um, it'd be really nice to get a fully polynomial time algorithm, even just in the realizable setting, um, we don't have anything for that. I think it's an interesting problem. One thing that might be worth exploring, uh, is there a way to modify the splitting criterion of influence um, and somehow have even fewer possibilities at each level? Maybe there's some way to like exploit symmetry, like somehow maybe our algorithm does extra work by like doing the same thing multiple times. Maybe there's some way to remove that. Um, I, I don't have anything concrete, um, but yeah, I, th I think it's a, it's a nice goal. Um, I, I, I second, have a second, oh, yeah, sorry. I have a question yeah. on that. Yeah. So I mean, let, let's say your F is exactly a decision S, a size S decision, yeah. even like a depth D decision tree, right? It's even simplified. It's like a depth yeah. D decision tree. Right? So, so really what you're showing is that you can replace any this depth D decision tree with one where every node is influential with respect to the decision tree. Yeah. Um, which limits the amount of decision trees in your search space to something like D to the log D. Um, do you think that just in that sense, you can hope to get the poly D? For every depth the decision tree, there's somehow a family of like poly D decision trees. I don't know exactly. I mean, close to it. Yes, yeah, so you find them in, in, efficiently. Is what you're trying to say something like we have this property on depth D decision trees, but like there might not actually be so many of them, even if we're like we think there are a lot, but maybe there's a more limited set we can look at. That's also good, but this this was what I was saying. Oh, I was saying that your definition for let's say a nice decision tree is one where every node is influential with respect to the sub function under it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Um, and this limits an amount of decision trees in the subfamily. Yes. What I'm wondering is that do you think that it's true that there is always some poly D family of poly D decision trees? that are somehow close to any decision tree. And I'm not sure exactly, or I guess here it should be like exponential in B, but like, like do you think that even if I you see. know that, how, how do you, do you find it efficiently that there's a combinatorial statement? You think that should be true? 
Um, I'm not sure, but one thing I should mention is that's stronger than what we use here because the family is a function of app. We are using queries as we go to like narrow in on the family we're searching over. So it's not like a priori, we have some family of decision trees that we find the best for. It is a family, but that family depends on F. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I need to reformulate my question. Okay. Sorry. No, no, but it's, it's a great question. I actually thought the same thing uh, that we, we were somehow searching over a family that like is an epsilon net for the space, um, but it ends up being not exactly what's happening. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, cool. Yeah. Great question. Um, okay. Uh, and another one is that, so our pruning lemma generalizes uh, the odonnell sackstrom servidio theorem. And that theorem has gotten a lot of mileage. Um, originally, uh, it was applied to studying the evasiveness of graph properties. Um, what this means is you have some graph, you wanna know if it satisfies some property, how many edges of it do you have to query to determine whether it has this property? And this theorem was used as a lower bound. Um, Subsequently, as apl applications and percolation theory, of which admittedly I know very little or essentially zero about, but seems really cool. Um, BLT, our prior work, used it uh, for learning theory. Um, so it, so it, it's had a lot of mileage in different areas. We now have this pruning lemma uh, that we also used in learning theory. Oh, and I'm saying learning theory um, because this task is also called like properly learning with queries, uh, but building decision trees. Um, so uh, question like, does this pruning lemma have applications to other areas? Uh, yeah. So yeah, um, that's all I got. Um, thank you everyone for, for coming and listening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, yeah, fantastic talk. Um, any questions from the audience remaining? I know that we had a lot um, during, which is fantastic. I could ask a question. This is Chris Musco at NYU. I thought it was a really great talk. Um, so the, the BLT result, I guess you said, you know is tight. It, it has this end to the log n. I've missed this at the end, but when you're asking your open questions at the end, is is this new algorithm, the having greedy parameter log log s, is, your anal is that a tight analysis? Like you have a lower bound for this method itself? Um, I don't think we have any lower bound. We know certain things are tight. So for example, OSSS is tight. So our pruning lemma, um, okay. it, there are certain formulations of it you can't hope to strengthen, but don't know that this particular algorithm, say we replace, ooh, okay, I think constant K, I think the lower bounds from OSSS probably prevent it. Um, I'm not hundred percent sure. Um, yeah, I think actually those constant K might not work. Um, okay. But I don't know for a particular like log s squared k. I, I don't think they would rule out uh, like I don't know singly log. And I uh, they also might not rule out constant k. So I'm not hundred percent sure. But yeah, that's a great question. Okay. Yeah, there there are definitely certain things we know are tight. Um, like the pruning lemma uh, can't be strengthened to imply a stronger version of OSSS. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense, and that I guess that's going to be tight. Yeah. And then like a second quick question is all this stuff about doing the like these influence based, it's almost like these heuristics people use in practice, but then you're getting proof logarithms out of them. Like what happens in the non-uniform setting, like your distribution's not uniform? Yeah, so everything we talked about, product distribution still works well, um, assuming like okay. your biases aren't super. Um, for non-product distributions, uh, I don't know of a great definition of influence. I think this is a great question, but it's not even clear how to define influence um, in a way that makes a lot of sense. Okay, but I guess product distributions, it's like you get some dependence on the ratio of like the min max probability or something like. Yeah, so we're cutting off at depth log s. So like okay. if you're like super biased, that's not going to be good uh, because you, you could have like a path that like is yeah, followed yeah, yeah. really deeply. Yeah. Um, but uh -huh. I think that is the only dependence we would have on the bias um, and all the definitions and stuff and, and techniques should go through otherwise nicely. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I have one tiny question. So yeah. like heuristically, it's more important to be like greedy early, uh, or sorry, like have K be larger earlier in your search space in this algorithm. Like, is there any value to like having a different like greedy parameter per depth when you recurse? Yeah, not anything I know of theoretically, um, but that is a great question. Maybe we can somehow, um, 
you know, change the pruning lemma in such a way that there, you can like kind of dynamically adjust things. Um, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if empirically something like that ends up being good. Maybe like somehow the beginning it's harder or like, I don't know, either the beginning or end is harder and you want to search harder. You want to search over more things and kind of in the other way, vice versa, it's easier. But yeah, nothing that I know of um, from a theoretical perspective. So I have a question, I mean, not specifically about this work, but more about the context. So what if you wanted to do pack learning and not you know, uniform? So do we know lower bounds of that? Like maybe assuming some harness assumptions? Like how much of that is specialized to uniform versus you know, general distributions? So um, all of the algorithms we described uh, require, MR has a depth cutoff, influence stuff requires product. So none of that will extend to arbitrary distributions. Um, I'm not sure of lower bounds. Um, one lower bound I do know even in the uh, uniform setting um, is there's an SQ lower bound of n to the log n. So uh, without queries, you shouldn't think of, uh, it, it seems unlikely, well, I don't know. SQ algorithms can't do better than n to the log n. Um, but yeah, I don't know of any lower bounds in non-pack learning, or sorry, in distribution free pack learning um, beyond that. And that's not specific to pack learning. So. Some hardness results by Alec Novich et al. in the distribution free setting for hardness of learning decision trees. Um, uh, I can I can send you the paper. All right, thanks. Sure. Thanks. More questions? Okay, so in that case, I'm going to stop recording.